Lucius Licinius Varro Murana, executed in 22 BCE. Varro Murana, the third and final prominent member of the Murana family, was a man on the rise in the late 20s. Well connected to Augustus's inner circle due to the political moves of his adoptive father, Varro Murana was on track to hold the consulship and participate in high-level political decision-making for years to come. However, when he was called upon to serve as the defense counsel for a beleaguered proconsular governor, Marcus Primus, Varro Murana either let his passion as an advocate get the better of him, or he was unclear about the princeps' intentions. After making an angry protest against Augustus' behavior in court, Varro Murana had no way to know that he had just signed his own death warrant. In 22, when Augustus discovered a Republican conspiracy led by Fanius Caipio, he insisted upon accusing Varro Murana and then numbering him among the condemned, despite both the lack of evidence for Varro Murana's involvement and the intercessions on the man's behalf by some of his own top advisors. Varro Murana's life and death illustrate two things vividly. First, the new dispensation in Rome meant that both the political fortunes and personal safety of every senator depended almost entirely on the favor and whim of a single individual. Second, although he was the August One who initiated the Pax Romana, we should remember that Augustus's new order was built atop a mountain of corpses and watered by a river of blood. Varro Murana's was just one of these corpses, and he was executed, I believe, to send a message to the rest of the Senate about how Augustus expected his pet senators to comport themselves in his presence. Let us first consider Varro Murana's birth family and the descent that he could trace from them. Murana's grandfather was Lucius Licinius Murana, and he had won a great deal of acclaim as a legate under Sola during the First and Second Mithridatic Wars. During the First Mithridatic War, he had been a capable subordinate commander who did a great deal of good as effectively a wing commander for Sola. During the Second Mithridatic War, he was left in charge of Rome's forces in the east, and he started a war. He ultimately didn't win the war, but he defeated enough enemy troops in the field to warrant a triumph, although it is a pretty weak triumph so far as triumphs go. Despite being well-connected to Rome's dictator, and from that point to the ruling faction for the next decade and a half or so, Murano was never able to secure the consulship for whatever reason. However, his son, the father of Varro Murana, also named Lucius Licinius Murana, did succeed in achieving the consulship in 62. He also had cleaved closely to the Optimate faction, mostly through the auspices of Lucullus. And when he ran for consul in 62, Cicero and many of the major grandees in the Senate were desperate to defeat Catiline's bid for the consulship, so they engaged in what amounts to a mass campaign of electoral bribery on Murana's behalf, so he ended up becoming a new man consul in 62. We know most of what we know about this Murana due to the Ciceronian speech pro Murana, where he defends his friend and successor against the accusations brought forth by the guy who got cheated out of the consular slot, Sulpicius Rufus, and Cato the Younger, who did not approve of electoral bribery under any circumstances. As for Varro Murana himself, we don't know exactly when he was born, but he was probably still very young when his father served as consul. One thing that would be interesting for young Varro Murana is the knowledge that because his father had held the consulship, he was no longer a new man, and that meant that he would one day have a great career. After, Var after Murana in 62, there were only two other new men consuls for quite a long time, and they both came in the year 61. Both of them were Pompeian supporters. And then after that, it mostly went to either patricians or very high-ranking plebeian nobles. So Murana, Varro Murana, that is, the subject of this video, was literally fathered into the nobility by having his father 
be one of the last new men consoles for a very long time. However, it's unclear exactly how much comfort that would have given him for much of his life, as it is very likely that his father died before he attained adulthood, as he ended up being adopted by the Varro family. The reason why I chose to use Sola's portrait here is that this is not, so far as I can tell, the Varro family of Gaius Var Terentius Varro of Canai fame, but rather a new Varro family that had arisen from the Equestrian Order and had gotten its start under Sola as well. So Sola is in many ways still the godfather of the Varro Murina Alliance. Young Murina's new adoptive father was Aulus Terentius Varro. In all likelihood, this Varro and the Consul of 62, Murina, had been close friends and allies, and Varro had adopted young Murina with the blessing of the late Murina. It would appear that Varro very much envisioned a merger of his family with the more established Murina family, and that is exactly what he achieved. Furthermore, this Varro had quite a bit of foresight when it came to using political marriages to advance his family's prominence, as we will see. Most likely, he himself did not have the most illustrious career. He was most likely a junior magistrate with the Pompeians during Caesar's Civil War, and after that point, he seems to have sort of abstained from the Second and Third Civil Wars, that being the war between Octavian and Antony, and then Cassius and Brutus, and then the war between Octavian and Antony. If anything, he might have gotten on board of the Augustus bandwagon very early on, and if so, that was to prove a very wise decision. Murina was close in age to one of his adoptive siblings, his adopted brother Aulus Terentius Varro Murina. If anything, Aulus was a few years older, since he would serve as consul, whereas Murina did not quite reach that stage. So the two of them were probably fairly close, and as you can see from the fact that Aulus Terentius Varro Murina adopted the name Murina into his own name, the project of the elder Varro to merge the two families was quite successful. Both Varro Murina, the subject of this video, and the other Varro Murina, who I'll just call Varro to avoid confusion, represented both families. However, the most important sibling, politically speaking, was Murina's new stepsister, Terentia. She married Augustus's confidant, Gaius Mycenas. While Mycenas did not hold any office, and indeed was not even a senator, he was an extremely powerful and influential guy behind the scenes, and by and large Augustus tended to follow his political advice. He was one of the fathers of the new political order, and aside from Marcus Agrippa, he was just about the best ally you could have. So. Suffice it to say that despite losing his father at an early age and then marrying or being adopted by a lesser family, if anything, this only helped Varro Murina's political standing in the long run because of all of the alliances that his stepfather was able to build. Further, Aulus and Terentia were half siblings of Gaius Proculius, who was a close friend of Augustus during his early reign. The only person that Varro Murina did not have a direct connection to via family was Marcus Agrippa, whose bust is featured here. However, as we'll see, we know of at least one time when they had to meet and interact, and that was when Agrippa replaced Varro Murina as the legate in Syria. So what I'm trying to get across is that Varro Murina was connected in some way or other with all of the major players in the Augustan circle. This man was extraordinarily well connected. Unfortunately, we don't know many of the biographical details of Varro Murina. The only reason that he ended up making Cassius Dio's history is because of the aforementioned incident at the Marcus Primus trial. If I had to guess based on the context, I would say that Murina was about 40 years old in 22, 
and that he was only a couple of years removed from holding the consulship. Anyone who was not a member of the imperial family still had to wait until the age of 42 to be consul, whereas, as we would start to see when Augustus's young relatives would come of age, an imperial prince could hold the consulship at the age of about 16. So, Murana, as someone who was not quite as well-connected as an imperial prince, would have to wait, but was still more or less guaranteed a shot at holding the consulship. We also know, as I established earlier, that Murana and his stepbrother Varro were a part of Augustus' political clique, even if they were just slightly outside of the very inner circle. Murana held an important post, and we know that he himself must have been held in fairly high esteem to have been given this post. That was the role of Legate of Syria, where he held it on Augustus' behalf from 24 to 23 BCE. At the same time, Aulus Varro was a prominent member of the Senate in Rome. This is something I'm pretty sure of, but not 100% sure of. There's actually been quite a bit of scholarly disagreement on the issue of who was who and who did what. Ronald Symes' book, The Roman Revolution, has it reversed, where Murana was in Rome and he was the consul of 23, and then Varro might have been the legate in Syria. Either that or an otherwise unknown Marcus Trentius Varro was the legate in Syria. But it looks like this is the way it actually went, that Varro Murana was in fact the legate of Syria, and that his adopted brother was a senator in Rome with Augustus. It gets confusing, I know, but Cassius Dio is our main source for this, and he's not super forthcoming on a lot of these small details. Not to mention that the fact that both of these men are known as Varro Murana helps to confuse things just a little bit. But based on the consular Fasti, which fortunately does record the years in question, it's clear that it was Varro and not Murana who was the consul in 23. Anyhow, given Murana's proximity to Augustus and his family's tradition of military command, most likely he had the requisite experience to hold the consulship, and he was within two or three years of being given the nod for that honor. So things were going well for him, mostly due to the fact that he was more or less born into a political faction which was very much in the ascendant. The civil wars of 49 to 31 had killed off a good number of Rome's leading families. By the 20s, not all that many families which had deep Republican roots were left standing. And over the course of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, most of those remaining families would slowly die off or be eliminated. So while there were still several prominent families in the 20s, there was still a considerable watering down of what it meant to be noble. And as a result, despite the relatively new status of the Murana family, Varro Murana was someone who could and did take considerable pride in his, quote, noble heritage. His father had been a consul, therefore he was considered a noble by the standards of the Republic. And while the Republic was dead in fact, in theory it lived on, and Augustus was very much about maintaining the facade of the Republic. So Varro Murana made quite a show of playing up his ancestry. He also, no doubt, played up his connections with Augustus, although he probably did this a little more subtly. Many of his peers owed their entire political standing to the appointment of Augustus. By the 20s, or maybe a little bit later, around half or so of the Senate had been appointed by either Augustus or his great-uncle Julius Caesar, so they were very much loyal to that family, but also, they didn't have all that much standing in their own right. Murana, however, was somewhat unique in that his family was established before Augustus came on the scene, and he was well-connected with Augustus. So he had two reasons to be proud, and not a whole lot of reason to suspect that anyone could strike back at him if he were to be a bit on the arrogant side. According to Cassius Dio, Murana was notoriously rough-tongued, 
and headstrong in his manner of address towards all alike. This might be something of a pretension on his part to try to play up the Republican heritage of his family. It is worth noting, however, this does not necessarily make him Republican in sentiment, as he was very willing and clearly able to take advantage of his connections with Augustus and to play under the rules of the new dispensation. That being said, it would appear that Myrna was insistent upon having his cake and eating it too when it came to the rhetoric he employed. He wanted to be seen as a representative of the old order, but at the same time he wanted the power that came with being in the new order. And up until about 23 or so, he was doing this successfully, but also possibly making a few enemies along the way. Following his victory at Actium in 31, Augustus had toured part of his empire and even gone to Spain for a while to help fight against the rebellion. By the summer of 24, he returned to Rome and his health was in shambles. It actually looked like he would die, despite the fact that he was only about 40 years old at the time. In fact, he was so sick that in 24, he resigned his consulship and handed over his signet ring to Marcus Agrippa in preparation for what he saw as his inevitable demise. In point of fact, he had something like 36 more years to live, but no one really knew that at the time. Augustus' health had been poor ever since he had gotten into the Game of Thrones at the age of 19. Somehow he made it to the age of 76, and it's not exactly clear how, but his health was always an obstacle. Going into the year 23, Augustus had recovered enough to embark upon an 11th consulship, and this time he chose his friend and ally, Varro, to be his colleague. Sharing the consulship with Augustus at this time was a sign of clear favor and trust, especially since Agrippa, Augustus's chief ally, had gone to Syria this year to replace none other than Varro Murina. So, Augustus was looking to build up the Octoritas of his key supporters, including Varro. Octoritas is kind of one's unofficial but very real authority that you get from holding the offices of state. If you are a consul or ex-consul, you have a certain amount of weight to what you say. And the idea is that Augustus held his position of power because he had the most doctoritas. So in order to keep the balance in his favor, what he did is controlled access to the chief magistracies and made sure that the people who had the most doctoritas aside from himself were people who were his best friends and family members. So it was a pretty successful and clever strategy. Clearly, Augustus's hope was that during this year, Varro would carry a lot of the weight of the consulship for him, and that Varro's stepbrother, Murina, would also do some stuff now that he was back in the city. Again, Agrippa wasn't there, and while Augustus had recovered, one has to imagine that the year 23 was not one of vigorous and sustained good health for the emperor. Early in 23, not long after taking office, Varro died suddenly. For Varro Murina, who was still in Syria, this would have been a sad moment as he did not get to see his stepbrother during his final days and did not even get to see his stepbrother take office as consul. So I imagine the two of them might have been fairly close and this would have been a difficult pill to swallow. What followed would have pretty severe political consequences. Augustus now needed a new colleague in order to maintain the forms of the Republic, so he chose Gnaeus Calpurnius Piso. This was a major find for Augustus. Piso had been something of a holdout for several years, and he was something like the symbolic leader of the Republicans in the Senate. He had started his career as early as 66 or so when he had embarked upon a prosecution. In 63 or 62, his father had been implicated in the Catalinarian conspiracy, so that was probably a setback. But the younger Piso had persisted and then fought for Pompey in the first set of civil wars and then fought under Brutus and Cassius during the second set of civil wars before finally surrendering to Augustus in 
and retiring. Even though he had surrendered and retired, it was understood that he found the new order to be most distasteful and that he did not approve of stripping the Senate of its real powers. By agreeing to serve alongside of Augustus, however, Piso was signaling his surrender to the new dispensation. He was making peace with the establishment, to use the modern phrasing. In my opinion, this was the event which set off the conspiracy of Fanius Caipio more than any other. While Piso held his support, he was considered to be the head of the Republicans, at least in terms of seniority. And because this group was fairly backward-looking and very much um, bound by tradition, they were not willing to go against the expressed wishes of their perceived leader. However, when he quote-unquote betrayed them, this meant that leadership shifted to men who were more willing to act. So for the men who dreamt of a counter-revolution in favor of the Republic, this was a moment that sent shockwaves through their ranks. The ultimate holdout, the guy who was the symbol of the old order, had sold out, and if he was willing to do that, then they needed to move quickly and decisively if they were to have any chance before the entire Senate was full of toadies. Another major consequence of Varro's death is that this possibly did some damage to Myrna's relationship with the Emperor. Myrna, as we've seen, was less than tactful, and he was not a master of polite interaction, for lack of a better term. Augustus, however, was a very subtle man. He rarely issued direct orders by this time, and his preferred method of communication was to hint in ways that were relatively clear what he wanted, and then have his subordinates go out and carry that out so they would feel like they had been consulted and that it had been a decision between the two of them rather than a simple issuance of orders. Augustus understood that the aristocratic temper was one which was very, very easily offended, so he was very sensitive about how he issued orders. For Murina, however, he does not seem to have been very skilled at subtlety. So perhaps when he met with Augustus without his brother there to interpret, there were some miscommunications. Murina tended to just say what was on his mind without having much of a filter, so this would have led to problems with Augustus, especially since Augustus would be looking to Murina to carry out some sensitive orders. At the time when Varro Murina was still serving as the legate in Syria, one of his colleagues, Marcus Primus, the proconsular governor of Macedonia, was removed from office and put on trial after he started a war with the Thracian tribe, the Odrisi. This was somewhat interesting as a trial since Technically, Primus was a senatorial governor rather than an imperial one, and so he reported to a different chain of command than someone like Myrna, who was directly reportable to the emperor. In general, most of the provinces with legions reported to the emperor directly, and most of the ones without reported to the senate, but Primus's command in Macedonia was one of the rare exceptions where it was both senatorial and in possession of troops. Murina was one of Primus's attorneys at the trial in 22, and it's unclear whether he was assigned by Augustus to hold this role or whether Primus sought him out because he knew that Murina was well connected with Augustus and thought that this was his best defense, especially since Primus's defense rested on the premise that he had acted under direct orders from Augustus to wage this war against the Odrysii. And so long as Augustus did not personally deny that he had issued the orders, this was probably a solid defense, especially with Murina at the stand with him, because Murina was a well-known ally of Augustus. So if he was backing up what Primus was saying, most likely this was a guaranteed acquittal. The only way that Augustus would show up, everyone believed, is if he was formally summoned due to the case. But because of Augustus' standing, there's very little chance that anyone would have the balls to try to summon him, as it might be construed as an insult. However, 
on his own initiative, Augustus arrived at court. And then the presiding magistrate, the praetor, called him up. He halted the other proceedings, called up Augustus, and asked him to testify if he had, in fact, issued orders to Marcus Primus to attack the Odrisii. And Augustus declared that he had not done any such thing, that there were no orders that had been issued. This was highly unusual as a court proceeding, as normally someone had to be formally called by either the prosecution or the defense, and a summons had to be issued to get that person to court, but Augustus simply decided to show up. So while he was normally very good at putting on the show of the Republic still proceeding the way that it was designed to, in this case, it was a crack in the facade, and one that apparently very much pissed off Murina. When Augustus engaged in this unexpected and irregular behavior, Murina lost his temper and effectively accused him of abusing his auctoritas and really just undermining the validity of the legal proceeding. According to Cassius Dio, Murina demanded to know, What are you doing and who sent you here? Augustus's retort as he walked off was, The public interest. Cassius Dio clearly thought that this was a very good retort and that Augustus had frankly owned Murina pretty hard. But apparently at the time, elite opinion was divided over who had been in the right, and we know this from the result of the trial, where the vote was divided. While Primus was in fact condemned, it had not been unanimous. Augustus thought that when he walked into the courtroom that he had decided the trial, that he had shown everyone where he stood and what he expected to happen. But effectively, what ended up happening is that he had given testimony, it had been challenged by Murina, and some people had decided that Augustus had been in the wrong, either procedurally or simply that he had lied. So, this was a problem for Augustus, and he was extremely pissed off about the way that this trial had gone. So, this is something to keep in mind about Murina's ultimate fate. So far as we can tell, this was the only real beef between the two men, who up to this point had always worked together just fine, and there had never been any problems. There's also a possibility, I think, that the fault here lays entirely with Augustus. Now, Cassius Dio wrote two centuries later, and he was very much a fanboy of Augustus, so for him, everything Augustus did was always in the public interest and it was always brilliant. But it is possible that as he was thinking about this trial from afar, Augustus decided that this would be a great opportunity to establish a precedent that any person in a senatorial province who commanded troops needed to make sure that he cleared all of his moves through the emperor first, so he decided to sacrifice Marcus Primus to prove that point. And he had not communicated that to Murina or anyone else ahead of time. So it is possible that Augustus made a snap decision, showed up and tried to get a result then and there, and that it was this surprise rather than the usual staged, managed political theater that he pulled off that really pissed off Murina and the others. Murina apparently thought this trial was legit and above board, and then it turned into a show. And yeah, uh, Murina made a mistake by challenging Augustus pri uh, publicly, but I think ultimately the blame lies with Augustus for not making his intentions clearer earlier. So it is hard to assess blame when our only source for this is two centuries later and an unabashed fanboy of one of the participants, but this is what occurs to me about this particular incident. In early 22, Augustus detected a conspiracy led by one Fonius Caipio, another man who had something of a pedigree, who was desirous of assassinating Augustus and restoring the Senate. According to Cassius Dio, who seems to be drawing upon Augustus' perspective in some way, Augustus very much thought that this conspiracy had stemmed from the trial of Marcus Primus, 
that many of the men who had voted to acquit Primus had then decided that Augustus must die. Whether that connection is true or not is very questionable. I personally tend to think that it was the consulship of Piso which had sparked an action on the part of Fanius Caepio and his allies. The seriousness of this particular conspiracy is not altogether clear. Many conspiracies in the imperial period would be very, very limp-wristed and very poorly thought out, and I get the impression that this was one of those. However, just 20 years before, Augustus had witnessed his great-uncle Julius Caesar get cut down in cold blood at the theater of Pompey. So he took such threats very seriously, and he moved swiftly to smash this movement in its entirety. Myrna was among those accused of being complicit, and most likely his supposed complicity had little to do with evidence that he was an ally of Fanius Caepio, and all stemmed from his involvement in the trial of Marcus Primus, where he had publicly denounced Augustus' behavior. If Cassius Dio's account is to be taken seriously, and we don't really have much of a choice since he is really the only source for this whole incident, then Augustus very much seems to have drawn the connection between the secret ballot, where Primus was almost acquitted, and this conspiracy led by Fanius Caepio. Whether Augustus was correct in his assumption or not is hard to say at this remove. However, it does seem that he perhaps overthought the importance of this ballot and that he more or less regarded the trial as something of a referendum on his own credibility rather than it being a trial for the life of a high-ranking official. So it is possible that Augustus's own ego and his fears, which were now exacerbated by his brush with mortality the year before, had gotten in the way of his judgment to some extent. As for Myrna, it is not entirely ridiculous to see him as a potential threat were he to go Republican. While he doesn't have a pedigree or personal fame which put him anywhere near Augustus's level, Augustus by this time had 11 consulships, his great-uncle Julius Caesar was who he was, and also, Augustus was a patrician. However, Murana did have enough credibility as a potential Republican and also had the political clout that he could have gathered the following and made a much more serious attempt on Augustus's position than someone like Aphanius Caepio. He also could have made the transition to the Republican faction because he was known for his old-school, outspoken nature, and especially now for standing up for Republican-era legal norms, even if he only did it one time. People were desperate for anything that looked like it might be in agreement with them, because effectively after 27, when Augustus was declared Augustus, officially, by the Senate, politics, in the old sense, was largely dead. It was now just what Augustus and his friends wanted, and then it was just a stage-managed affair. So, Murana, in theory, could have put himself at the head of a conspiracy and mounted a fairly severe challenge, especially with Agrippa out of town. However, there is no actual evidence that Murana did this. So far as we can tell, he remained an ally of Augustus, just as committed as ever. He was just really pissed off about this one trial. But, because he had challenged Augustus in public, and because Augustus was convinced that it was this trial which had led to the conspiracy, he either thought that Myrna must be involved, or else that Myrna's behavior had caused this conspiracy to happen, even if he wasn't personally involved, and therefore Myrna needed to be eliminated. So, Augustus could not be moved from his wrath against Faro Myrna for what he had said at the trial. And again, if Cassius Dio was correct, this was literally one sentence. Whatever the actual justice of Augustus' decision, one does have to admit that he moved efficiently and ruthlessly to crush the opposition. 
after the dissension he had encountered in the Primus trial in terms of the vote count, Augustus decided that holding a formal trial with a formal vote by a jury was a risk that he could ill afford. If this threat was as real as he feared it might be, he needed to move decisively to quell it entirely. Therefore, all of the accused conspirators, including Varumirana, were condemned in absentia, and executioners began to hunt them through the streets of Rome immediately. There was no trial. Augustus simply declared that these men were guilty of a crime and dispatched the executioners. Or more likely, one of Augustus's followers announced this and then the Senate just said, I, and the executioners began running through the streets. The official explanation that Augustus offered for his action was that he knew that the conspirators were fleeing and didn't want them to escape. He thought that if he held a trial, this would give them an opportunity to slip away and that then they would go somewhere and raise a rebellion and disturb the peace of the realm. So that's the official story, but I think the real story is that Augustus was simply afraid of losing the trial or of being challenged again by someone like Varro Murina. It's also worth noting that many people in Augustus' inner circle, including Gaius Proculius and Mycenas, both objected to the execution of Murina, and they effectively told Augustus he's not guilty of anything, he's just kind of a dick. But Augustus wasn't really willing to listen, and so Varro Murina was among those who were executed at this time. Typically speaking, scholars talk about the conspiracy of Caipio and the Primus trial as being one sort of unified event known as the Primus affair. The split vote that drove Augustus so crazy led to his personal intervention in the way that trials were conducted. After this, there was no more secret ballot. Augustus found this to be a threat as it gave people cover for acting in resistance to his wishes. So instead, he forced all the jurymen to orally announce their verdicts and then required a unanimous vote for conviction. In the future, he would be much more clear about what he wanted to make sure that all of the jurymen would know which way to vote. And they would be forced to lend their own voices and votes to the decision that Augustus wanted. The Primus affair and its fallout was also one of the major reasons for Augustus making adjustments to the first settlement of 27 in the so-called second settlement of 23. This would have taken place before the execution of Varro Murina, but because the Primus affair involves Varro Murina so heavily, he still effectively played a role in convincing Augustus that further changes were needed. This video has already gone longer than it should, so I'm not going to get into the differences between the first and second settlements. That is a complicated topic worthy of its own treatment at length. Murana's death also demonstrated the danger of speaking out against even Augustus, the supposedly even-tempered emperor, and from this point forward, Augustus was very rarely challenged in public. I would say there's a good case to be made that Varro Murana was executed in part because Augustus did not like to be backtalked by senators. He wanted them to treat him with the utmost respect and deference at all times because he had the most octoritas, and he very much apparently did not like Varro Murana's personality or approach to public speech. So far as I know, Varro Murana was the last of the Murana line. Three generations of Muranai ended in execution at the hands of Rome's first emperor. This would become a pattern. Over the course of the Julio-Claudian period, many of the surviving old families of the Republic died off, and some of this was due to imperial distrust of men with good pedigrees who might potentially be able to arouse the loyalty of the fallen Republic. There were men in the Senate, including the later historian Tacitus, who romanticized the Republic and dreamt of bringing it back. 
in the time of Caligula when he fell ill and had no heir, there were senators talking about potentially restoring the rule of the Senate. So this was something which remained sort of stillborn for a long time, and Augustus wasn't necessarily wrong to fear it, no more than his successors were wrong to fear it. However, because there was no actual evidence against Varro Murina, and because Varro Murina had been a loyal ally with one exception for his entire life, this episode does reveal that while Augustus was indeed a very talented ruler, and that and while he did bring a great deal of prosperity to many Romans, this was still a man who had some serious faults. He had a strong tyrannical streak. He was not willing to tolerate dissent. He could and did act unjustly at times if it was in his own personal interest, and his unjust actions could and did often include bloodshed. He was much more concerned with advancing his own personal interest and the interest of his family than he was with doing the right thing. We should never forget that. And this was especially true when Augustus was younger. By the time he was older, it wasn't so much that he had matured and mellowed out as that all of his enemies were dead. Everyone knew what Augustus wanted, and they gave it to him, because they owed their positions to him, and by that point, it had been a while since he had killed people, so people were willing to forget that Augustus's rise was built on a skull pyramid. So, let's beware of over-romanticizing Augustus, but also realize that the Pax Romana that Augustus created would not have been possible without a lot of the bloodshed that he engaged in. I think that Varro Murano's career is a perfect illustration of that. He, Augustus effectively sacrificed Varro Murano unjustly, but in the service of keeping the Senate in line and preventing more civil wars from occurring. What I'm saying, effectively, is that I know there are a lot of people out there who are very much Augustus admirers, and I just want you to know that you should be somewhat critical, that you should look at him and see both the pros and the cons. And I hope that this exploration of Varro Murana's life has illustrated the importance of doing so. I'm Thersites the Historian, and I will see you later. Hopefully soon I will get around to doing the life of Varro Murana's grandfather, who celebrated a triumph in 81, which was somewhat questionable, but we'll get to that when we get to that.